In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance family. And as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is truly the mother of God. Mary is also the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We're also in the month of October, which happens to be the month of the Holy Rosary. So let's turn to Mary and ask Mary to help us. So Mary has many titles also. Mary is also known as our, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's say the prayer that Mary loves most. Asking her, Santa Maria del Camino, to be with us all the days of our life until we arrive at heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, my friends, let's turn to our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has very many titles, among which he is the paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our soul. The Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as the interior master. St. Paul goes on to say that we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans. So we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. Let's turn to the Holy Spirit and ask Him to give us a lot of light, a lot of joy, a lot of peace, a lot of strength, a lot of courage, an interior fire to burn within our hearts. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us by the same Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord, amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Anthony Mary Claret, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we welcome all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, I would like to pray for you. And I'd like to pray in a special way. First, for your sanctification. 
that all of you would try to pursue a life of holiness. As our Lord says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Then I'd like to pray for your families and your children who are exposed to much evil today. Many areas, but especially in many academic areas, many children are being exposed to an erroneous vision of the human person. We know and we believe that we're created in the image and likeness of God. We're created as man or woman, male or female. Many modern liberal agenda are trying to promote a false vision of the human person, poisoning the minds of our children. You are the first teachers of your children. You're called to form their character, their moral life, their spiritual life. You're called to be you're called to be the first catechist. First and primary catechist is the mother and the father, <clears throat> the parents. So take that seriously. And I'd like to pray for you uh, that you'd be able to carry that out well for the salvation of your children. My third intention would be that all of us would try to grow in our prayer life. that we take seriously our prayer commitment. That all of us would try, would really strive to be faithful to our holy hour, our rosary, our sacramental life. This can help us. Always remember the purpose of your, your being on earth. Call to mind often principle and foundation. You are created to praise God. To reverence God. to serve God and by means of that to save your soul. Constantly we have to remind ourselves of our principle and foundation. We are here on earth a very short time, my friends, very short. And we're called to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God in this life so that we can be with him forever in heaven. So those are my intentions for you. My friends, let's enter into the infinite reservoir of graces that come from the Word of God. Every time you go to Mass, the Vatican II documents speak often about the two tables that nourish us. The table of the Word of God, and then the table of the Eucharist which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Table of God's Word, the table of God's Eucharist. J. 
Jesus would say to the devil when the devil was tempting him after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He would say to the devil that man does not live on bread alone, but lives on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So the readings today, we are still reading the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, which is St. Paul's of all of his letters, it's the most developed theologically, Romans. We've arrived at the very heart of Romans, Romans chapter 8. And um, it's um, Romans eight twelve to 17. These six verses are not complicated. In St. Paul, what he does, he speaks about a contrast within us. He speaks about those living by the flesh and living by the spirit. We all understand this. Either we live according to the flesh or we live according to the spirit. Maybe you've heard this story, but this story illustrates the message of St. Paul to the Romans today. It's a story there of a man who's walking with his 12 year old son through the woods. They're taking a, they're taking a walk. The father says to the son, son, I have within me a ravenous wolf, a wolf that is angry, mean, vicious, malicious, bent on devouring me. So they're walking for another 15 minutes and the son is thinking, my father's got a wolf within him. What does that mean? Then after walking 15, 20 minutes, the father stops and looks at the son and says, you know, son, I have a lamb within me. This lamb is gentle, friendly, loving, kind, friendly, meek and humble, and gentle. So they're walking for another 15, 20 minutes. And the son, all this time, is thinking about his father who has both a wolf and a lamb within him. And the son cannot resist. He's in suspense. And he turns to the father and says, Dad, which of those two are going to win? The wolf or the lamb? The, son, the father rivets his attention to the eyes of his son and says, Son, whichever one of these I feed most. Whichever one of these I feed most.
That story is your story and that story is my story. Either we feed the wolf or we feed the lamb. Whichever one of these we make an effort to feed or nourish will be the one that will win within us. That's the first reading today. That story illustrates very clearly the first reading today. Either we nourish the flesh within us, that leads to death. Or we nourish the spirit within us, that will lead us to life. We have to choose because we're free individuals. Probably the best way to really understand this is to enter into our hearts and to see whether or not the capital sins are dominating and controlling us. Or the opposite virtues. Let's go through those. Either the capital sins will dominate within us. And the flesh will win. Or the opposing virtues will dominate and conquer within us. And we will experience truly, truly the freedom of the sons and daughter of God. So let's uh, briefly go through them. That will take us to the gospel. The gospel passage is, is very, very uplifting. So, St. Paul speaks about the contrast between being li living in the flesh and living in the spirit. And because of original sin, we all have this, this, dual dynamic within us because of original sin. St. Thomas will call this formi peccati or concupiscence, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. <clears throat> so let's go through them. Gluttony. Lust, avarice, sloth, envy, anger, pride. Those would be the seven wolves that we have lurking within the inner recesses of our souls, of our hearts. Once again, gluttony, lust, avarice or greed, sloth, laziness, envy, anger and pride. Those are the wolves. Those are the wolves within us. What about the lambs? The lambs are the opposing virtues that we're called to, to practice. So let's talk briefly about these lambs and pray in our holy hour. That the wolf, that the flesh within us would die. But the lamb, the virtue within us, would, would grow, blossom, and flourish, and bring forth an abundant harvest in eternal life. So 
So the, op the opposing virtue to gluttony is that of temperance. Temperance means this. It's one of those moral virtues according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Temperance can be defined as the moderate use of created goods. That refers especially to eating and drinking. Here's the question. Do you eat to live or live to eat? I repeat, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? If you eat to live, you practice temperance, the lamb. If you live only to eat, the wolf is dominating you. How about the capital sin of lust? And the opposing virtue would be chastity or purity. Lust is a disordered desire for sexual pleasure. Good definition. Lust is a disordered desire for sexual pleasure. The contrary virtue would be that of chastity or purity. And the corresponding beatitude is Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. That is, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. <clears throat> blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Then we have the capital sin of avarice, also known as greed. How might we define that? Avarice or greed can be defined as a disordered desire for material things. If you're taking notes, a disordered desire for material things. In sin, there is disorder. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, quoting Thomas Aquinas, actually goes on to say that sin is, sin also goes against reason. So the opposite virtue of the lamb would be that of generosity. Learning that there is more joy in giving than in receiving. There's more joy in giving than in receiving. Eric Fromm says, if you are what you have and you lose what you have, who are you? That's a good one. Eric Fromm, if you are what you have and you lose what you have, who are you? The philosophical word would be that of materialism. Materialism. Then you have the capital sin of Sloth, which is also known as laziness. The opposite virtue of the lamb would be that of diligence. The work ethic. And remember this, idleness is the workshop of the devil. You've got children. Make sure that they're active. Otherwise, the, the devil will get in there, even with ourselves. Every day we should have a full schedule. We're working hard because we're working for the Lord. And as St. Paul says, whether you eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. And then we move into the capital sins that are more of an intellectual nature. The first four are more corporeal. 
sins more of the body. The last three are more of a an intellectual nature. We take that of envy. How might we define envy? Envy is I become sad because I become sad because you have something that I don't have. And we end up by comparing ourselves to others. Spiritual writers say that comparisons are odious. And the net result of comparing yourself to others is always sadness. We become green with envy. The opposite would be that of admiration and gratitude. I admire the gifts that you have, and I'm grateful to God for the, for the fact that he's given you these gifts. We should cultivate an attitude, and gra attitude of gratitude and cultivate the gifts that God has given to us. Not be always looking at others. Certain sense, you probably had mind your own business. Be concerned on cultivating the gifts that God has given to you, to me. We all have gifts. Then there's the capital sin of anger. We lose control of our inner peace and harmony when we give in to impatience. The opposite of anger would be that of meekness. And meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. Jesus himself describes his heart in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. The only time that he describes his heart in two ways. He says that I am meek and humble of heart. So the opposite of anger is meekness, powerful emotion under control, meekness. And last but not least, we have the capital, we have the capital sin of Pride. Pride is a disordered love for self. Pride is a disordered love for self. And of course, the opposite of the capital sin of pride would be that of humility. A humble person recognizes that all the evil that we do, it's because of ourselves. Or is all the good that we're able to carry out is because of God's prevenient grace and his overflowing bounty and goodness in our lives. his prevenient preceding grace and his abundant overflowing goodness in our lives. So my friends, I thought that uh, that, that analogy would be the best way for you to understand the reading today. Because St. Paul speaks about the flesh and the spirit. That we are not debtors of the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. We have this interior battle within us because of original sin. And either the wolf will win 
or the Lamb of God will, live, will win. The wolf is gluttony. The lamb is temperance. The wolf is lust. The lamb is purity. The wolf is avarice. The lamb is generosity. The wolf is sloth or laziness. The lamb is diligence and hard work. The wolf is envy. The lamb is admiration and gratitude. The wolf is anger. The lamb is meekness. The wolf is pride. Disordered love for self. The lamb is humility. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto, the, unto, unto thine. So hopefully this analogy and this explanation will help us so that we'll put to death the wolf within us so that the lamb, the lamb of God, would dominate in our life that we would not be controlled by the desires of the flesh, but be guided and be moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The Responsorial Psalm, Psalm 68. The Antiphon is, Our God is the God of salvation. Our God is the God of salvation. A short but very efficacious prayer could be simply this. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Our God is the God of salvation. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, save me. So, that will take us right into the gospel where we see Jesus saving someone. Because the name Jesus, which comes from Aramaic, means God saves. We should beg Jesus to save us from our own slaveries, to liberate of us of the wolf that's within us. That we should do of that wolf that we have within us. We got the wolf and the lamb. Which of the two will win? Whichever one we feed most. So my friends, let's go to the gospel for today. We're into Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. What do we have? We have Jesus, who's very active in his public life, and Jesus, we see Jesus on Saturday, which for the Jewish people, the Saturday would be the Sabbath. Just a note on that, Saturday is the Sabbath, whereas for us, Sunday is the, is the chief day of the Lord. The reason being is because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. And every Sunday is like, a, it's a mini resurrection. So very often in the Gospels we see Jesus on the Sabbath, and he's found there in the synagogue. Just that you're aware of a synagogue would be like they had one temple built by Solomon, the Temple of Jerusalem. Then every town 
would have its local synagogue, which would be its local place of worship, its local place of worship. So, Jesus is there, and you have the synagogue official, and you have the people that are there in the synagogue. Now, what is most evident there is the following. Jesus sees that right there is a is a woman that's suffering very, very much. And we should never forget that Jesus is Jesus is our Jesus is the divine physician. Very often we'll see Jesus actively healing people. He is the divine physician. He's healing people. So, he arrives and there's a very clear evidence of a woman who's suffering very much. And involved in this infirmity of the woman is the evil spirit. The evil spirit has this woman bound, and what she, what what she has is she's got it. She's crippled. She's crippled, and she's bent over. She's bent over, so she can't. She cannot straighten up. She cannot become erect and and look up. She's bent over. The gospel says she's completely incapable of standing erect. So think about that. Means that uh, if you think you think about that for a minute, she'd always be looking down. She'd be always she'd always be looking down. Right. L looking down, she couldn't look up at the sky, couldn't see the sun, couldn't see a rainbow, but basically looking down on earth, the ants, the worms, the dirt, looking down. And there's a lot of symbolism in that. A lot of symbolism. So Jesus entered in the synagogue and she he sees this woman. And this is not said explicitly, but it's obvious. Our Lord has great compassion on this woman. When we say the word compassion, compassion is a compound word that comes from Latin, and it means cum passio, means to suffer with. He suffers with this woman. His heart is moved. And he doesn't ask her any questions, but he wants to heal her of this infirmity right away. So he draws close, and he says to this woman, 
you you are set free from your infirmity you are set free from your infirmity you're free, you're set free from the the bonds that the evil one has you under So you have the word of Jesus, you're set free from your infirmity. And St. Luke, who is also a physician, we celebrated his feast day last week, October 18th. He mentions this detail. It says that Jesus laid his hands on her. So we have both the word of Jesus, which of, is, which of course is the word of God, because Jesus is God. Then we have the healing action of Christ, Christ actually touching. Jesus would sometimes carry out miracles just by his word, other times by touching. It depends. For example, in Mass, we saw Jesus healing another person. We had Jesus healing Bartimaeus. Who was Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus was a, a blind beggar sitting on the street corner there in Jericho. Bartimaeus cried out, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have, have, have mercy on me. Jesus asked him, What do you want? I want to see. And Jesus said, Let it be, let it be done to me according to your faith. And he was healed of his blindness and it was simply the word of jesus sometimes it'd be the word other times it'd be both word and action or gesture so bartimaeus was healed of his blindness now this woman who was stooped over for 18 years by the word of Jesus and by his healing touch. She stood up straight and at once. See, not only does Jesus heal, but his healing is immediate. So she stands up. And then right after that, St. Luke points out that she glorified God. She glorified God, and that's exactly what we're called to do in our lives. As I said at the very beginning of our conversation today, We are created to praise God. Or if you like, we are created to we are created to glorify God. We are created to worship God. So this woman ends up by praising God with her lips. Because God has healed her. Think about that, 18 years in which she has been a slave in a certain sense of the evil spirit. She's freed. And the people see this. And they are astounded at seeing the power of Jesus Christ in the life of this woman.
Now, there's a reaction. There's a reaction. And the reaction is, it's, it's very sad to see what happens, but this is what happens. So the synagogue official sees this miracle and right away he rebukes Jesus for having healed this woman. So the synagogue official says this publicly by rebuking Jesus by carrying out this extraordinary miracle of compassion, mercy, kindness. This woman has been 18 years under the yoke of the devil. Jesus, moved by compassion, heals the woman. Then this man blurts out, there are six days when work should be done. Come on those days to be cured, not on the Sabbath day. How cold, how cruel, how inconsiderate, how this man's heart had been shriveled. He only focused he only focused on the letter of the law and not on the spirit at all. He's only focusing on the exterior, the letter of the law, the facade, rather than on the spirit. And I think, my friends, we have to be careful in our own lives. We gotta be careful in our own lives. That we don't spend so much time focusing on the exterior and we forget about the interior, the spirit. So the Bible teaches us man can read the appearances but God can read the heart. We might have a little bit of the hypocrite within us. We pay so much in, we pay so much attention to the exterior that the interior is lost. Pay so much to the the exterior that the interior is lost. Now, Jesus is not silent. He's going to defend this woman. And as always, Jesus is surrounded by a crowd of people. And, of course, his disciples were there. So Jesus responds and he calls this man a hypocrite. A hypocrite. He's double faced. He's blind to seeing the presence of God. There he has the Messiah, the Redeemer, right in front of his eyes, but he doesn't recognize it. Jesus is there in front of him carrying out this extraordinary miracle of compassion in his synagogue and he's condemning the Lord, the Lord who came to save. And our Lord gives a very simple example that everyone can understand and we can understand it today 2,000 years later. And he, he speaks about a, a, a farming <coughs> a farming image. 
how many of you will untie your ox or ass from the manger and lead it out for watering. So you've got an animal in the barn or the manger. It's the Sabbath day. Okay, you untie and let him drink some water. In other words, we, he's saying to them, you, you hypocrites, you're placing an animal in his needs above a human person. And Jesus goes on to say, this daughter of Abraham, this was a Jewish woman, the daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years now. I think that's very interesting that Jesus says that this infirmity, this sickness, was actually caused by Satan, the evil spirit. So a certain St. Jesus did a healing and an exorcism at the same time. Jesus says that she, she was bound for 18 years now. Ought she not to have been set free on the Sabbath day from this bondage? What Jesus is really saying is this. He came to save. He came to give liberty. And doing good to others doing good to others should be twenty four seven. We're never free, my friends, from carrying out the law of love, the law of charity. So Jesus comes out very strong against this hypocrite who is blinded to see that the Messiah, the Savior, is right in front of him working this stupendous miracle in his synagogue. Jesus comes down strong. He calls him a hypocrite. Times Jesus would be very strong with people like this. So the last verse points out that all of his adversaries, Jesus had friends, and many. Jesus had friends, but he, and he also had many friends his disciples, the apostles, Mary and Martha. But also Jesus had many enemies, among which were these Pharisees, many were Sadducees, and these were hypocrites. They were always seeking an opportunity to Condemn the Lord. And it says that all his adversaries were humiliated. So our Lord actually humiliated these hypocrites. And of course, this would make them even more angry against Christ. Such that they would want to put him to death, which eventually would happen what eventually would happen. But the crowds, the crowds that surrounded Jesus had a different reaction. As this woman rejoiced and praised God, 
So it says the whole crowd rejoiced at all the splendid deeds done by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful passage. I'd like to give you one or two applications. This woman was crippled. She was looking down. The first part of our conversation today was a comment on St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the flesh and the spirit. And I gave the, the story of the wolf and the lamb within the man. Like this woman, maybe in our lives we're, we're looking down, we're, playing, we're paying more attention to the flesh than being led by the spirit. We're focusing more things on the earth. True that we have to have our feet on earth, but maybe, my friends, we're called like this woman who was paralyzed for these many years. Ask the Lord for the grace to be able to look up to heaven. That's right. To have our eyes focus more on heavenly things today. Lift up our gaze to the Lord. In the midst of the problems of life, let's lift up our, our eyes to God and focus on God. And focus on Mary, Stella Matis, the star of the sea. Now let's pray. Let's pray that the Lord, let's pray that the Lord would heal us. Pray that the Lord would heal us of our own paralysis, our own infirmities. Let's pray that he would heal us. Jesus, his, name's, his name means God saves. May he heal us of our interior paralysis, our interior sicknesses. Beautiful prayer. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. So I'd like to end by giving you my priestly blessing that God would heal us so that we can be a source of healing to a broken and sick world. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.